Director General of the National Museum of Korea. Uh, she has a long bio here, one page, uh, but I think if she wanted to list everything, it would be several pages, so I will spend some time and read this to you. She was educated uh, in Muhlenberg College, Allentown, Pennsylvania in USA, and she received uh, MA and PhD from Department of History of Art, the Ohio State University. Uh, if I say just this, you will wonder whether she can speak Korean and uh, be the Director General of the <coughs> National Museum. But I will add the fact that she is a graduate of Chungi Girls High School, which is the which is one of the two best girls high school in Korea, the other being the Ihua Girls High School from which I graduated. <laughs> and um, she was, before moving to the Seoul National University, she taught at Tokson Women's University where she and I were colleagues for some years. And from 1999 to uh, just before she assumed the directorship, uh, she uh, served as professor of uh, Department of Ar Art and Archaeology, Seoul National University. And she served as a research associate at the Arthur Sackler Museum at Harvard University, USA. Uh, among many publications, I, she listed just a few, so I will introduce them to you. Uh, the first one, Korean Art Tradition, co-authored with An Hui Jun, Kim Won Young, and Yu Young <coughs> published by the Korea Foundation in 1993, in Korean and in English. Uh, and the next one is in Korean, but uh, I will read the translated title, The Origin of Western Modern Art, 1880 through 1914, uh, published in Korea, 1996. And the next one, Art Form and Zeitgeist, uh, also in Korean, Yeolhwa in 1998 and uh, Art of the 20th Century Korean, Yegyeon Publisher, 1998. <coughs> and Korean Modern Art and Visual Culture. This was edited by Dr. Kim and published in 2002. And the last one is in English, Tradition, Modernity, and Identity, Modern and Contemporary Art in Korea. Uh, this was one of the series of uh, publications called Korean Culture, uh, published, planned and published by the Korea Foundation, and uh, published by the Harlem Publisher. Uh, the CEO of Harlem Publisher is today here. Uh, and 20th Century Korean Art, London in English, 2005, and Hyun uh, Hawa sorry, I will read the English title, Art of the 20th Century Korea, to Change and Challenge, Ye to 2010. And another one in, uh, published in Japan, Kankoku Kindai Bijutsu no Hakunen. This means uh, 100 years of uh, Korean uh, contemporary and modern art. Uh, this was published in Tokyo in 2011 in Japanese. Uh, may I invite Dr. Kim Young Na to the podium? Please welcome her with a big round of applause.
evening and thank you for your nice introduction. It is an honor to be the last speaker of the, of the Sokiata so Koreana Lecture Meeting. And the title of my talk today is The Impact of Korean War on the Arts. This is the uh, paper I gave last year in London of British Association of Korean Studies. So, I'm, so I'll stop. In, in many ways, the people of Korea are still waiting for the Korean War to end. The standoff between North and South Korea across the demilitarized zone located on the 38th parallel continues to wield invisible influence over both countries, not only in politics, but also in economy, society, and culture. Although the war has been directly represented in several landmark works of Korean literature, such as Che in hoons The Square, and Yi byung Ju's Jiri's and Mount Jiri, there have been very few works of visual art which have explicitly addressed this national trauma. It seems that the distress of witnessing the ideologically motivated massacres, retaliation, and other atrocities of the Korean War effectively deterred Korean artists from responding with works of, of a distinctly political nature. Although the war and its aftermath clearly had a lingering effect on these artists, most of them were only able to artistically rectify their horrific memories and experiences through metaphor. This presentation is a survey of the impact of Korean War on art and artists in Korea. First, I will present the activities and works of the official troupe of war photographers and war artists, respectively. Then, I will examine how the Korean War was remembered by artists in government commissioned war monuments and works based on personal wartime experience. Finally, I will analyze more recent works by artists who did not experience the war to see how the Korean War has been viewed by later generations. The Korean War is remembered through photography more than any other medium. The United States National Archives and Records Administration holds hundreds of thousands of photographs related to the Korean War. Journalists from all over the world came to Korea when the war broke out and approximately 270 reporters and photographers con contributed to the prodigious photographic history of the conflict. One of the most iconic images of Korean War is Max Desfors, Pulitzer Prize winning photo photograph of refugees scaling a bombed bridge over the Daedong River in Pyongyang, which you see now on the screen. This image of North Korean civilians risking their lives to seek freedom and democracy in the South justified the mission of the United Nations, which deployed large numbers of troops to the war. The South Korean government was not prepared to deal with the war in any systematic way. It was only in August 1950, two months after the war began, that the government managed to mobilize an official war photographer's troop under the Army Information Agency of the Department of Defense. According to a number of testimonies, many of these men came official war photographers based on the promise of the identity card and the exemption from the draft. During wartime, the Army Information Agency was charged with disseminating war photographs through the press and other outlets and securing the understanding and trust of the public. The official war, war photographer's crew was responsible for recording and reporting vivid images of the war. Although they were not financially compensated, 
The photographers were provided with necessary materials, including Kodak film and Leica 3B cameras. They were also allowed to eat at the Department of Defense canteen and to ride in military vehicles. All of their photographs were subject to control and censorship, and those pictures that were approved would often be displayed on the news board at the Army headquarters as well as for civilians in the rear. Unfortunately, the film negatives which were kept at the Army Information Agency have disappeared due to poor management. Most of the surviving photos were taken using, using personal cameras and remain in private collections. Therefore, the specifics of the situation at the time are difficult to verify. Lieutenant Im in who led who led the information agency of Army Official War Photographers Troop, captured many images of the war before he was charged in June 1952. Some of his pictures, such as American soldier captured and murdered, were picked up by the Associated Press and sent across the world, receiving wide coverage in the U.S. press. Interestingly, since pre-war photography in Korea had been dominated by pictorialism, very few photographers were experienced in straight photography. Thus, the war images captured by Korean photographers tend to be highly artistic, as exhibited in Imin Sik's destroyed T-44 34 tank in photo. The slant of light in the frame robs the destroyed, abandoned tank of its menacing materi materiality, giving the photo an aura of a romantic image of ruins. Of the Korean photographers, Lee Kyung Mo had the most experience with documentary photography. As a staff photographer for the Honam newspaper, he had previously captured vivid images of the Yos Rebellion of October 1948, which arose from a conflict between the right and left images, right and left wings, foreshadowed the Korean War. Lee was one of the most, I'm, I, I'm, uh, I thought I had his picture of uh, photos, but I just realized I didn't have, so I just skipped. Uh, very briefly about him. Lee was the one of the most active of the Korean War photographers, capturing images of the refugees, the South Korean Army's advances, the North Korean prisoners of the war. The photographer's experience covering the war instilled a strong sense of duty in them and became the foundation for the rise in popularity of documentary photography after the war. The Korean Department of Defense did not form the official war painter's troop until June 1951, a year after the outbreak of the war. The Department of Defense ostensibly expected to get depictions of battle scenes, representations of the lives of refugees, and yearnings for peace, but in reality, the artists received few specific directives. In fact, there were some who believed that certain cultural figures persuaded leaders of the de Department of Defense to establish the troop in order to protect artists and provide them with accommodations and ID cards. Thus, it seems that the official war painter's troop may have been formed for reasons other than the systematic production of painted representation of the war. Few of the artists from the troupe regularly witnesses heavy combat, though most made occasional trips to the front line to make sketches. They relied on returning soldiers to tell them about the handling of the prisoners of the war, the disposal of dead Chinese soldiers, and extent of damage sustained by South Korean army. 
the approximately 40 members of the official war painters troupe held a total of six exhibitions of war documentary paintings. The first of this war painters exhibition commemorating March 1st movement was held in Busan in March 1952 and featured the work of 25 artists. Most of the works were small drawings which depicted life in the rear unrelated to the war. Even nude paintings were included. At the sixth and final official war painters through art exhibition held in March 1953, the Minister of Defense Price went to Munhakjin's Munhakjin Trench, a vivid portrait of soldiers crawling in the trenches and throwing grenades. Sadly, the painting itself became a casualty of the war, surviving only in the form of black and white photographs. In 1951, traditional ink painter Yu Byung-hee painted Battle on Mountain Doso, which depicts an intense skirmish between the North and South Korean armies. The flag of South Korea soars high in the air, while the North Korean flag has fallen to the ground, suggesting the former's triumph. The number of war-related works by Lee Soo Ok have also survived. The graduate of Tokyo Imperial Art School, Lee was active in North Korea before the war. Based on his record of service as the chair of an artist alliance in North Korea, it can be safely presumed that Lee was familiar with the socialist realist style. When the Chinese army entered the war, he took refuge in the South with his family and he eventually became the official war painters who served in the Central Front. Night Battle in 1952, which depicts soldiers digging out a trench, was exhibited in the same year as the first official war painter's troop exhibition and received by the Army Chief of Staff Prize. This accomplished painting is noted for its outstanding composition and its realistic rendering of soldiers engaged in a battle firing stun grenades. Of the paintings produced by the official war painter's troupe during the Korean War, only a minimal number depicts fierce battles. Most of these focus on South Korean army while showing little of the enemies. The reason for this is that the painters did not share a collective feeling of patriotism that might be expressed as a wish to destroy the enemy and conquer its territory. In an internecine conflict like the Korean War, it is not always easy to distinguish one's own forces from the enemy or to separate the victim from the perpetrators. Painter Legion explained some of the wartime problems faced by the official war painter's troop. And I quote, the war painters made several works, but most of them are just small sketches, so it is very difficult to call them serious war documentary paintings. But you have to remember that there was a lack of materials and that we were all focusing on how to live day by day and survive the war. There wasn't a lot of desire to make our work anti-communist or to encourage people's morale. I also believe that we wanted to avoid using our paintings to document the tragedy of our people fighting one another." Unquote. Since it was the official war painter's troops' duty to document the war, most of the works discussed about focus on realism. However, the Korean South Korean war painters understood the socialist realism, which was born in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, represented the artistic mainstream in North Korea. Notably, 
when these painters worked as individual artists rather than as members of the trio, they actively tried to distance themselves from the realist style. At that time, the main alternative to realism was European modernism. Isouk's experienced with Cubis, experimented with Cubism in his 1954 work, The Korean War, which he painted after the war had ended. The figures portrayed in this painting, a father pushing his child and his belongings on a cart, a young girl carrying a younger sibling on her back, a mother holding a bundle of blankets with a young boy walking by her side, representing the actual experiences that most Koreans had during the war. But the agony of becoming a refugee dis dis dissipates because of the balanced composition in which geometric shapes are fit together like a puzzle. The work from this period that is most strongly influenced by Pablo Picasso's Veronica 1937 is Pyongyang's, uh, Pyongyang One's Anti-Communist Wandering Spirit, 1952, which memorably delineates the inhumane and indiscriminate carnage of war. The painting shows human and machine hybrid figures holding arms and dashing across a battlefield. These fragmented forms with, with their bulging eyes and bodily dimensions are reminiscent of Picasso's distorted figures of women uh, from, the, from the 1930s and also suggest a sort of madness often associated with surrealism. Many Korean artists continued to address these issues well into the 1950s and 60s. But instead of providing more portraits of battle or refugees, the war-related works which appeared after the end of the war more often dealt with abstract topics such as the individual's attachment to life and the loss of faith in humanity. Nam Hwan, who left for Paris in 1954, continued to focus on his memory of the war in his works of the 1960s. Nam Hwan remarked that the fallen soldiers, broken limbs, and refugees he witnessed during his flight from Seoul became motive for his abstract paintings. The dark colors and mood of his painting, the movement in the shadow, which seemed to represent the transformation of a human form into an abstract form, reflects the lingering pain of the war. Kim Yongju, who worked as an official war painter, tried to express humanity's despair in his work Age of Darkness, which he worked on from 1958 until 1961. He, Kim places a scene of the crucifixion against the black background in a work that is reminiscent of Isenheim Eltapis, um, 1515, 1515 by German Renaissance artist Matthias Grunewald. The theme of despair also haunts a related drawing by Kim entitled Black Sun Crucifixion uh, Korean War which shows the Madonna and child, the crucifixion, an image of a bird, and a screaming human being. Since the end of the Korean War, many of the most notable war-related artworks have been the national monuments initiated by the government. These monuments serve to remember those who died during the war and to represent the belief and ideals that they died for. Even before the Korean War came to an end, sculptor Park Chil Sung erected his mother and child commemorating the recovery of the lost territory in Sokcho, a city near the 38th parallel where many North Korean refugees lived. Park's sculpture emphasized the importance of the family 
because one of the most traumatizing aspects of Korean War was the dispersions and death of the family members. The theme of the mother and child was frequent, frequently used in monuments and post-war art. War monuments only began to be constructed in large numbers in the late 1950s, once the government system had recovered from the shock of the war and regained some degree of normalcy. Anti-communism was the foremost policy of South Korea, and it was the duty of all male youth to serve in the military. This militant social climate is well reflected in the war memorials, which began to <coughs> appear all across the country, the majority of which were highly formulaic. For example, Kim, Kim Kyung-sung's monument to the dead soldiers of the Army, Navy, and Air Force, which was erected in 1957 in Mountain Yongdu Park, Busan, featured three figures symbolizing the, uh, three branches of military holding rifles, bayonets, and grenades, while the central figure is holding a dog. The figure's muscular physique and the overall heroism of the monument are reminiscent of the socialist realistic style. Nevertheless, there was no criticism on this similarity at the time of its unveiling, and its idealized image of the heroes served as a model for later monuments. Perhaps the most nationally celebrated war monument was Monument to General MacArthur, also by Kim Young sung This sculpture, which was an initiative of the Department of Domestic Affairs, was erected in the Incheon Freedom Park in 1957 to commemorate the seventh anniversary of the Incheon Landing Operation. The operation, successfully man maneuvered by General Douglas MacArthur, led to the reclamation of Seoul and the retreat of North Korean army, and marked the critical early turning point for the South Korean forces. The monument was largely financed through donations collected from citizens at the behest of President Lee Seung Man. In addition to the statue of the General, there, which was based on photographs supplied by the military, Kim also created a pedestal decorated re relief depicting the Incheon landing operation. More than 40 years after the Korean War ended, the national effort to remember the war continued. In June 1994, the National War Memorial opened in Yongsan, Seoul, commemorating all the wars in Korean history. However, almost half of the exhibition space is dedicated to objects related to the Korean War, which illustrates the persistence of the bitter memories of that conflict. Outside of the massive memorial hall, there stands statue of brother in 19. 94, a huge sculpture of two brothers sharing a dramatic embrace. Based on the true story, the older brother is a South Korean soldier and the younger brother is North Korean soldier. This motif of two brothers who are forced to become enemies has now appeared in so many Korean dramas and movies that it has almost become cliché yet it remains the best symbol for the tragedy of the Korean War. At the end of the 1950s, a group of young artists led a collective outburst of artistic expression related to the war experience. These artists, many of whom graduated from either the recently established College of Fine Arts at Hongi University or Seoul National University, were members of the post-liberation generation. They had strong, distinct memories of the war, since all of them either fought in combat or grew up 
amidst uh, the turmoil of the post-war years. These young artists, who were filled with sorrow, doubt, and disbelief, were searching for a spiritual anchor, and they were extremely disillusioned with the conservative nature of Korean art. They had great affinity for movement such as informal and abstract expressionism, which emerged from the rubble of Western Europe after World War II and eventually reached the United States. Korean artists found much to identify with in the works of these movements. The post-war spiritual dislocation, the lack of faith in formal method, the disdain for established power structure, and the passion for artistic innovation. Although the Korean often did not have access to detailed, detailed information about art, art, and formal or extra expressionism, they remained extremely enthusiastic about the dynamic intensity of the brushwork and the overall autonomy of the paint, which they saw in contemporary European and American works. Many Korean and foreign artists <coughs> created works reminiscent of European and American gesture art by using aggressive brush straw to slather thick layers of paint onto huge canvas. In the realm of sculpture, young Korean artists began experimenting with welding metal, a technique that had only recently emerged as an artistic possibility. Although Korean society was impoverished and deprived of many vital materials, there was no shortage of scrap metal. Many sculptors procured metal pieces and barrels from the numerous scrap metal dealers and iron foundries, which they then cut with a straw cutter and welded into sculpture. The fiery process of torch welding made these war-tested young artists feel like warriors. One particularly important source of material was the metal barrels, which the American army used for distributing or selling oil, which were cut open, flattened, and fabricated into other metal products, including public buses. Ak Chong-bae recalls that he often used the remnant of military vehicles, which he found on Mount Wahoo near Hongik University. I quote, whenever I used those metal plates to make a war, I remembered the scars of war and realized the meaning of the power called destruction. One work which Park made from scrapped military vehicle was circle of history, which he described by saying, quote, the world held traces of a glaring rage, sharp pains, and tender pains called criticism, as well as heaving anger that was on the verge of bursting, as well as an approachable volcanic hit, unquote. The rough, craterous surface of the world is indeed reminiscent of destructive anger and explosive passion. Akso Gwan Scorched Earth, 1968, is a similar work which the artist described as expressing the human feeling of emptiness after the wretchedness and misery of war. As the title suggests, the contrast between the smooth surface and rough interior of metal symbolizes ruined soil or a society ruined by war. As the South Korean economy grew by leaps and bounds in the 1970s, artworks which addressed the war became scarce. It was not until the emergence of Minju missile translated People's Art in the 1980s, the topics related to the Korean War resurfaced. Led by a generation that did not experience the war, Min Jung-Misul was not interested in producing works which directly depicted scenes of war. 
Instead, they took on the problem of dispersed families and protested against the influence of U.S. military, which remained a fixture in South Korea after the war. Lee Wok Sang's painting, Kim Family After the Korean War, takes the form of a family picture taken at the birthday party of an old parents, but six figures in the room are whitened out. The picture contains no clues as to the fate of these vanished figures, leaving the viewer to imagine where they were or, or whether they are still alive or not. Minto artists view the culture of the West as trash, stained by the influence of capitalism and materialism. They identified with the Minjung or common people's culture, which was firmly rooted in the earth. Thus, many of the foremost works of the movement treated farming as their subject. Sinatra's modern Korean history, rice planting, shows the southern half of the peninsula filled with the garbage of capitalist and materialist culture, while the northern half contains an idealized depiction of farming communities. In 1989, the authorities reacted to this war, which they felt was a pro-North Korean by confiscating the painting and imprisoning the artist for violation of the national security law. Beginning around 2000, a new generation emerged with its own unique perspective on the Korean War and its impact. Kim Hong Sok's video war Wild Korea 2005 presents itself as a documentary featuring interviews with the real Koreans but it is actually a fictional film with a script and professional actors. The story starts from the premise that in 1997, the Korean government legalized the private possession of firearms in an attempt to become an advanced democratic country. With the access to guns, people react to even the most trivial issues by shooting and killing one another. One interviewee states that he was kidnapped by his ex-girlfriend and then killed in front of the crowd of onlookers. He claims that he was shot because his face was red and that his face turned blue from the shot just before his death. With this, with this ending, the viewers come to realize that they have been watching an interview with a person who is already dead. The video ends with a scene declaring that after three months, the Korean government again prohibited the position of firearms. There are many ways of to interpret this work. It reflects the society where people have been endlessly conditioned to report any suspicious people as spies. Also, the killing scene evokes an execution, execution by a people's court during the Korean War. Most of all, the reference to color in Korean society is a solid critique of the nation's ideology. Since the ending of the Korean War and the division of the country, Koreans have cons cons consistently been subjected to anti-communist ideology, which identifies the color red with the most dangerous form of dissidence. Although the frozen relations between the North and South have shown sporadic signs of thawing, the ideological color remains a political problem that is strategically deployed every time there is a transition in government and which contributes to the strained relationship between the two Koreas. Kim's video work functions as a comedy which forces us to confront difficult facts and reflects the culture and ideology of Korean society. In response to the several decades of Korean military culture, Lee Yong-bae created his, 
Iyongbe created his work, Angel Soldier, which combines diverse art forms such as performance art, video art, and installation art. Against the fabric, um, fabric flamboyantly decorated with, with digitally printed flowers, soldiers whose uniforms and rifles are camouflaged with more flowers Participate uh, more flowers. Okay, sorry. Uh, flamboyantly uh, decorated with digitally printed flowers, soldiers whose uniforms and rifles are camouflaged with more flowers participate in a military drill called the Silent Walk. At first, the viewer finds it difficult to discern any movement, but prolonged attention reveals that the soldiers are slowly and repetitively moving forward and stopping. In the entire 30 minutes video, the soldiers only cover about 16 meters of ground. Their forward movement was executed in deadly science, slash, slash, silence, but when they stop, the soundtrack fills with the sound of birds singing. In this simulated battlefield, the soldiers are in constant danger of being vanquished by the flowers. The title of angel soldier takes on added meaning when one realizes that angel is also a slang for a computer hacker who attacks the large corporate networks. Tom Junho, another artist in his early 40s, has demonstrated a similar interest in both the military culture, which has become a mainstay of Korean life, and the demoralizing situation in North Korea. One of the John's preferred media is Sneak as Puppet. Recently, there has been a lot of ecological interest in the demilitarized zone which divides Korea, stretching for 155 miles across the 38th parallel. The DNC has been preserved for 60 years without any human presence. For the series on air project, photographer Kim Atta used his 8x10 camera to capture almost 10,000 long exposure photos of the DNC, which he then digitally superimposed to create a time-lapse sequence. Because of the camera stillness and the duration of the exposure, any signs of movement were inscribed as a ghostly visit. Kim said that whenever he set up his cameras, the North Korean soldiers were on high alert creating a very tense atmosphere. The primary subject of the finished series is time itself, which has allowed nature to reclaim the area and vanquish all traces of the war after a mere 60 years. The Korean War was unlike any other war in that it was not caused by territorial incursion or a conflict of interest between two countries. Rather, it was a war between proxies of two ideologies, democracy and communism, which was fought between people who had previously shared their history. Korean war art did not consist of systematic propaganda, which enacted clear distinction between allies and enemies. Even though there was an official troop of war artists, its members assert that they witnessed and depicted the war through their own eyes rather than as a member of an official institution. Even after the war, instead of showing pure contempt for the enemy and support for the homeland, artists focused more on universal human ideals such as freedom, dignity, and unity. Another remarkable trait in this individual bodies of work from the post-war period 
is that the fact that they all tend to reflect the influence of abstract art of modernism. Because of the colonial period and the war, Korean artists felt somewhat antiquated in terms of international trends, and they resolved to catch up during the post-war period. The works of later generations, such as the Minjung artists and the 21st century generation, show that there remain significant difference in perspectives on the Korean War and the country's division. They regard the division of Korea as a collateral result of power struggle between stronger nations, which cannot be solved by two Koreas alone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your interesting and stimulating lecture on Korean art related, uh, Korean war related art. Uh, she really covered a wide range of artworks, um, starting from photography and painting, sculpture, relief, monument, video art, and other very modern uh, media. This was really a wonderful exposure to the arts that are not very well known to the uh, general public. Uh, now, I would like to open the floor for question and answer. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and identify yourself and ask questions. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm the Argentine ambassador. Um, uh, thank you a lot for your uh, lecture. It is a fascinating subject. And uh, I should like to, to make you a question about the role of government in South Korea if uh, there was a, a, a direction to the artist in order to create an official art regarding the war. Well, uh, uh, as I uh, mentioned in the first part of my uh, talk, although there is an official artist troops, it was not uh, made to produce systematic war, official war paintings. It was more of uh, providing the artist ID card, which was at that time very important and to provide them accommodations. And they are not given any uh, directives of how to paint or what to paint. So it is, although the name is, they have the, they are the official artist, but they didn't really, in reality, produce any official paintings. So it, they, are, they are more like, a, so when, as I said in the, my talk, when they, they are having an exhibition, it was not related, most of them are not related to the war, and they didn't really have the chance to go into the combat. Only a very, uh, several people were actually experienced on combat, so it's more like a prod providing them to live and to survive because during the war they don't really have any means to sell paintings. So when you say official painters, uh, like in European uh, history, there has been many official painters who went with Napoleon and painted uh, his triumph, but it was not really like that, yeah. Another question? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I just wondered if there was anything you could say about what was happening in Korean art before the war, from uh, 45 to 50, whether there was any whether there was any link between what you're talking about and what was happening after the war. Um, well, um, so when uh, the actually all the oil paintings or some sort of Western style painting only began uh, around 1910. Uh, before, uh, 
before actually uh, for, to say more accurately before 1915 there was no old painter uh, most people were um, painting in ink medium and, and there was really no art school until 1945 so if you want to learn uh, modern techniques or modern art uh, they, they went to Japan to and then they went into Tokyo School of Fine Arts or other private schools. And some, sometimes I was asked, why didn't they go to Europe, for, which is the original place to learn? But at that time, it was very, in, during this colonial period, it is very difficult to obtain um, passport or visa because it, you have to get a Japanese passport. So, <coughs> Even though it's not cheap to go to Japan, you have to spend as much money to go to Japan as well as I mean, then compare with the euro. Uh, most people went to uh, Japan, and for instance, uh, from Tokyo School of Fine Arts, which is now Tokyo uh, University of Tokyo, uh, we have about forty-five painters who graduate from oil uh, oil painting department and there were uh, in uh, during the colonial time we have a, a large scale government sponsored exhibition uh, which was held once a year which was a debut place and in the beginning in 1922 there are many Korean artists but later around 1930s half of the uh, artists who submitted work were Koreans. I mean, uh, there were also uh, Japanese uh, who lived in uh, Korea can also enter the competition. So uh, probably, I think, when you count only oil painters, maybe there are 100, 150 who, who, who probably think himself or herself as a painter, but most of them have a, uh, they, their means of living is from uh, being a teacher at high school or you know, something like that because there isn't a good market for them. Yeah, so, and then, and then they experience impressionism, post-impressionism, and there are some people who experiment with abstract painting and only in 1930s, there are several people who had been in Japan experiment with abstract, but they were not very much well appreciated. So that's about the situation before uh, the liberation. And from 1945 to 1950, there was uh, this conflict with the left and right wing, and it's not a really, uh, you know, ideal time to paint. Yeah, so, uh, so our uh, modern art act actually you can safely say begin uh, maybe uh, after the war, maybe 1955, 57. Uh, my problem uh, for I would ask uh, what's the prospect of the uh, the influence of the war on art. The world has been divided for more than 60 years. Maybe in the next decade, do you think this kind of impact will continue in the Korean art? So, um, nowadays, uh, the young generation, as I uh, mentioned, are not really interested in the war itself. They are more interested political situation we are now in and they uh, now real I mean everybody realized that we cannot solve ourselves alone. So it is more like uh, the Korea and the world and the I don't know six nations. <laughs> it's, <laughs> so it's uh, they are keenly realized and they they are not I mean I think that uh, this uh, influence of Korean War and that influence not only artists but every Koreans 
politicians, of course, but um, artists and housewives, and I think it became part of our life. So you cannot really separate them from, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think um, we had three questions and wrong answers, and we are running out of time. And one more question? Yes, please. Uh, uh, have you ever uh, uh, had a, a, a chance for a speech on, uh, on Korean world and uh, uh, interrelation between Korean boy and the art in your Asian visual world? Uh, um, no. <laughs> um, our museum, National Museum of Art, more covers the uh, Korean art so far before, I mean, before 20th century. So we cover mostly the end of Joseon period. And we have uh, another institution called Museum, National Museum of Contemporary Art, and they are more or less have a collection of the uh, modern and contemporary. But I feel uh, it's really a, a time for National Museum of Korea should collect the paintings uh, up to at least 50 years before. Because when we say cultural property, that means it's a 50 year that you keep the, if any paintings produced in 1960, it can be cultural property. So we are now trying to collect, extend our uh, collection up to modern. But I think the one we want to collect and the ones that National Museum of Contemporary Art collect can be different. Because we want collection that shows how in our context how the tradition lived on in contemporary art, whereas I think the National Museum of Contemporary Art is more interesting, or more something more innovative or something different. So I, uh, that's what I think um, we are now thinking. And so, so we have not had any exhibition in Korean war in our museum, but neither the Museum of Contemporary Art. So this is something we can do as a, it's a I think it's, but it's, I think people, I don't know, it's, a, you have to be, a, it, it can be very sensitive. And especially when you are a national institution, you have to be really make sure that it doesn't cause any <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would like to ask you, ask your opinion on the Korean War Veterans Memorial in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, may I have show of hands, how many of you uh, have seen the Korean War Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. Oh, quite a few people. So you know um, which one I'm talking about. And I think it is one of the most impressive war monuments in the world. So uh, I would like your opinion. Actually, I wrote uh, one article about it. And uh, when you when we talk about Korean War Memorial uh, Monument, you can really separate them with the Vietnam Memorial because Vietnam Memorial is very abstract and caused a lot of uh, um, argument. And some people really love it, but some people hate it. So uh, the Korean War Memorial uh, try to kind of uh, combine all these two, uh, two uh, various perspectives. And so they want uh, the monument can relate to everyday life or uh, uh, ordinary people. So they make the size 
uh, they make the straight stitch not on the pedestal. They uh, want them just walking. They are on a petrol and they are our size and we can really relate them. And they want to uh, express uh, not the uh, nation's uh, opinion, but they want to show the experience of the real soldier. So there are 19 soldiers all wearing panchos because most of the uh, Korean war veterans remembered Korea was very cold. And when you ask, what is your memory, everybody said, it was cold winter. And so uh, they, they showed that uh, these uh, ordinary soldiers were patro patrolling. And it uh, shows a uh, very real experience. And so I think it's not something that you have to be kind of looked upon. It's something can be really relate. And I think it's a very uh, makes some uh, kind of turning point for what mem war memorial should be. Yeah, yeah I really like the uh, memorial. I mean the monument, and uh, there is a small reflecting. Uh, a pond, a uh, pond of remembrance, and it says, uh, "Freedom is not free," which is really uh, what it means, and it really uh, commemorates those uh, precious lives that were lost in Korean War. I hope everyone of you can visit Washington. Thank you very much. We Thank will very much. wrap up and please give her another big applause.